declare the nurse Thano Paradis unavailable so that the court can allow for the introduction of Mr. Paradis's preliminary hearing testimony as well as selected portions of his grand jury testimony. Uh, as the court has hopefully had a chance now to read, we have submitted an affidavit which was signed yesterday by Dr. Robert Chesney, who is Mr. Paradis's treating physician, who is a cardiologist at Daniel Freeman Hospital. Dr. Chesney has been treating Dr. Mr. Paradis for over 20 years. Right, I've read the statement. Um, we thank your honor that there is no alternative given the tenuous nature of Mr. Paradis's current health that he has been uh, home only for two weeks recuperating from his latest surgery and we would seek to have the court declare him unavailable and then we can turn to the question of what portions of the preliminary hearing testimony would be admissible whether there need to be certain redactations done, et cetera. Uh, so I'm first focusing on the question of unavailability and, let, and later on what portions we should have admitted. All right, people. Yes, Your Honor, we spoke with Mr. Paradis' doctor today who indicated to us that there would be no problem with examining Mr. Paradis in the Daniel Freeman Hospital. The problem that the fear that he has is not that, the do that Mr. Paradis will have um, a heart attack, but only that there may be some arrhythmia and that it would be easily accommodated in a room at the Daniel Freeman Hospital where there are facilities that could be arranged for that examination. So Mr. Paradis is not unavailable. All right. Do you have any competent evidence besides a hearsay on a phone call? Well, we can call the doctor in. If you would like, we can file a further declaration from the doctor indicating what he told us today. I'd like to see that. Okay. We'll do that. You know, we have not had, <laughs> I've been in court, and uh, Mr. Goldberg was the one in touch with him, and he, we weren't sure, if, I thought perhaps we were going to have a full-blown 240 hearing, at which case there would be opportunity to take testimony. Um, but if the court would like a declaration from the doctor and we can resolve it that way, that'd be fine. Well, I mean, what do we, uh, what do we contemplate, Ms. Clark, as far as going to a hospital? Do we contemplate a uh, conditional examination? Do we contemplate taking the jury with us? What, we, are you, what are you contemplating here? We, either one, it would be fine. We can take the jury with us because they have uh, conference rooms there that will accommodate uh, the court staff and jury so that uh, testimony could be taken. Uh, and the doctor does work out of Daniel Freeman Hospital. And the doctor would be present for the testimony. Or we could videotape it uh, in that same facility. E either one is possible. But shouldn't I be concerned if the doctor wants to have or insists that this examination be conducted in a hospital facility? I mean, doesn't that raise some concern for Mr. Paradis's health and well-being? Which concern the doctor feels will be adequately addressed by having it at the hospital. The doctor is the one who can indicate to us what his concerns are, how grave they are, and how they are best addressed. And obviously, the court would always prefer to have live testimony in front of the jury than to mark a transcript, which the, judge, which the uh, defense knows is not his position at all, and thereby misrepresent what the true nature of his testimony would be. I think we all want the jury to have the truth, and if we can get the truth best by accommodating the doctor's concerns by following the procedure I've outlined, then I think that all parties will be well cared for. When do you contemplate being, a, being able to uh, file a uh, declaration from uh, Dr. Chesney? I'm sure that we could do that. Uh, let me check with Mr. Goldberg, Your Honor. May I? Certainly. We could get a signed declaration to the court this afternoon if the court will accept a fax signature 
Um, I would indicate to the court, however, that since the declaration filed by counsel is hearsay and not admissible in evidence, the people would move to strike the declaration with the opportunity to cross-examine the witness. Counsel, I'm trying to do this the easy way. Okay. I, right. And then I'm saying, you know, well, then either way. Then it would be equally applicable to your declaration as well, correct? I agree. So you're insisting that we have a 240 hearing? I, yes. I okay. Well, I'm Fine. insisting that we... Friday, 2 o'clock. Have your witnesses here. All right. All right. Let's have the jury, please. Dr. Heisinger, would you resume the witness stand, please? All right, Mr. Kelberg. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And good afternoon, doctor. Doctor, um, I wanted to move to this area of your examination of Mr. Simpson on June 15th. Um, regarding evidence of any bruising. Do you recall being asked questions about that by Mr. Shapiro on direct examination? Yes, I do. Would it be accurate to say that you carefully examined Mr. Simpson for any evidence of a contusion on his body? Is that a fair statement? That would be a fair statement. Now, was that examination of the same thorough and completeness that you originally stated your orthopedic examination was? The bruise exam was extremely thorough. Uh, the hand exam, uh, in terms of drawing pictures, was not because we had detailed pictures of the hand, and so I wanted the pictures to suffice for that, but I realized that the pictures would not show the bruises, so the, spent a lot of time with the bruising and the skin, whereas uh, the hand, basically, we uh, got the majority of our pictures there. Doctor, why then draw anything with respect to the hands if you felt that you had photographs that adequately documented any hand injury in the way of cuts? Uh, I think mainly just to look at the joints and to try to get an idea which joints uh, were swollen and um, see if that corroborated with uh, any other orthopedic things, basically, since I just wanted to circle those just so that I'd have that for my uh, orthopedic exam. I'm going to get into the hand-drawn hand outlines uh, in just a moment, but would it be a fair statement that after your thorough and complete examination of Mr. Simpson or any evidence of contusions that you found that he had sustained none, correct? He had no contusions over the four stated portions of his body, correct? And is it accurate to say that in response to... Uh, Mr. Shapiro's further questioning that if he had sustained blunt force trauma on June 12th, you would have expected to see some evidence of that in an examination conducted roughly two and a half days later on June 15th. Is that what you said? If it was of significant enough nature, correct. In other words, the person can receive a blow 
and not sustain a contusion as a result of that blow. Isn't that true, doctor? That is true. And there's been testimony here uh, from Dr. Lakshmanan about something called a glancing blow, where the full force of the blow is in fact not received by the recipient, and in such circumstance, one would not expect to see a contusion. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Now, doctor, you said, uh, let me invite counsel again, this is to the real-time uh, transcript. Um, make sure I have the... Um, page 346, you were asked to describe the area of his right upper extremity, shoulder, biceps, etc. And you were asked the question, was there any evidence of any recent contact? And your answer was, no, there was not. Do you recall that question and that answer, doctor? Uh, yes, I do. And in fact, would it be accurate to say that your testimony with respect to all areas that you examined was that you saw no evidence of any recent contact to Mr. Simpson in the areas examined. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, you said this afternoon, though, that he could have been the recipient of contact and not have had evidence of a contusion at the time of your examination. Isn't that what you've said this afternoon? If there wasn't a major impact and you don't have bleeding, you don't have edema, correct, you wouldn't see anything. But, doctor, your answer on direct examination was there was no evidence of recent contact. You did not limit it to contact of sufficient force to cause a contusion. Isn't there was, that correct? There was no sustained. It is argumentative as phrased. Rephrase the question. Doctor, in your original answers mm -hmm. to Mr. Shapiro, in which you said there was no evidence of recent contact, you did not limit that to contact with sufficient force to cause a contusion. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Now, doctor, I want to uh, ask you to assume hypothetically that there's been testimony again from Dr. Lakshmanan in which he evaluated blunt force trauma to the hands and arms of Ronald Goldman. And that in the opinion of Dr. Lakshmanan, there is no compelling evidence to indicate that Mr. Goldman ever struck the perpetrator of the murder with a direct blow. I ask you to assume that hypothetical, okay? Give me that one more time. I want you to assume that Dr. Lakshman and testified, and perhaps could I have Mr. Lynch's assistance, Your Honor? I need to set the easel up here just to show one board of photographs. Three sixty one, Your Honor, and three sixty one A, the patch job. All right, Mr. Bancroft, avoid this, please. See, we don't have Mr. Bancroft. And, Doctor, with your, with the permission of the court, would you please step down to this photographic exhibit? This is exhibit uh, 361, and the title of it is Blunt Force Trauma, Sharp Force Injuries and Defensive Wounds to the Left Arm, Left and Right Hands of Mr. Goldman. I want to ask you to assume that these photographs fairly and accurately represent the condition of each area of photograph of Mr. Goldman's body at the time of the autopsy conducted on June 14, 1994. Have you ever seen these photographs before? No, I have not. Now, doctor, I want you to assume hypothetically that Dr. Lakshmanan said, with respect to photograph G26, that the injuries he sees to the back of Mr. Goldman's left hand do not reflect a blow delivered to the perpetrator, and that, in fact, what appears to be a contusion uh, near the wrist of the left hand has what is uh, described by Dr. Lakshmanan as a punctate abrasion in the center of it. I ask you to assume all of that. And further to assume, and I'm going to get another board of photographs if I can just briefly do so. Exhibit 359. Excuse me, doctor. Exhibit 359. 
that Exhibit 359 shows the area of crime scene where Mr. Goldman's body was found. It's entitled Possible Sources for Ron Goldman's Blunt Force Trauma Injuries. Have you ever seen these photos before? No, I have not. Now, Doctor, I want you to further assume that Dr. Lakshmanan said from his examination of the environmental surroundings of uh, 875 South Bundy and the blunt force trauma to the back of Mr. Goldman's left hand, it was his opinion that there were sources at the crime scene to reflect that Mr. Goldman had flailed his arm backwards to avoid attack and had sustained the blunt force trauma in a defensive effort to just protect himself. I ask you to assume that as well. Okay? You have to answer audibly, I'm sorry. Yes. And that, again, in the opinion of Dr. Lakshmanan, this evidence of blunt force trauma to the back of Mr. Goldman's left hand did not suggest that Mr. Goldman had struck whether a direct or indirect blow on the perpetrator. Do you understand that hypothetical? Yes. Now, with respect to, and it's photograph, if Mr. Lynch could help me the far G32. end. G32. That shows the back of the right hand of Mr. Goldman. And that, with the exception of what appears to be a contusion, Doctor, do you see a contusion near the middle finger at the base of where the middle finger joins the hand? You see yes, that? Yes, I do. With the exception of that contusion, it was Dr. Lakshmanan's opinion that all of the other injuries are inconsistent with a blow being struck, direct or indirect, on the perpetrator by Mr. Goldman and are consistent with, again, flailing both arms now, right and left backwards, and coming in contact with rough surfaces, such as the bark of a tree, such as a metal fence that has irregularities from the paint, and so forth. Do you have that understanding? Yes, I do. And further, that with respect to that one area of contusion, it was Dr. Lakshmanan's considered opinion that that did not reflect a blow delivered to the perpetrator, because taking into account its location as inconsistent with where you would expect to see a uh, contusion if there had been a fully directed blow, that is, you would expect to see a contusion in other areas of the uh, joints of the hand, that with respect to the appearance of punctate abrasions centered on other contusions on the right hand in the center, which the far photograph, Doctor suggesting again that there had been contact made with a hard surface that at the point of contact had a rough aspect to it to create the punctate abrasion. That all of that series of injuries was consistent with flailing and not a direct blow being delivered. Your Honor, I'm going to object at this point in time. Uh, this is not a question, this is a oh. lecture. Oh. And further, Doctor, that Dr. Lakshmanan testified it would be illogical for a person who is being attacked by a knife to try and deliver a blow like you delivered uh, on the stand earlier today because it would bring the victim closer to the knife rather than further away. And further that Dr. Lakshmanan's opinion was that this uh, contusion was not evidence of a blow because there was no evidence of defensive cuts on the back of either the right or left arm of Mr. Goldman which he would have expected to have been inflicted if Mr. Goldman tried to block the knife with his arm in an uh, action of punching. Ask you to assume all of that, okay? With that said, we can take the photographs down and I'll get to the question. hypothetical set of circumstances, doctor, would it be accurate to say that your examination showing no evidence of a contusion to the body of Mr. Simpson was fully consistent with Dr. Lakshmanan's testi testimony as I offered it in the form of that hypothetical? You may answer the question, doctor. Yes. And further, Doctor, if you assume that Dr. Lakshmanan said that even if one assumed that that one contusion on the right hand that I pointed out does not have a punctate abrasion on it represented 
contact in the form of a blow between Mr. Goldman and the perpetrator, that a glancing blow would not leave necessarily evidence of a contusion on the murderer. Assume that hypothetically. That would be fully in accord with your own testimony this afternoon in that area, correct? If there isn't sufficient force delivered, you will not get evidence of trauma. And in fact, you can have evidence of trauma on the victim from the effort to deliver a blow without having concomitant evidence of a contusion forming on the recipient of the blow, depending on the angle of force. Isn't that correct? That's a very tough question. I'd have to research uh, the literature. That's, that's really over my head in terms of whether that's possible or not. Well, in I'd fact, that would be in the area of a forensic pathologist. Well, it's going to cover. Yes, you have to let the doctor finish his answer. I apologize to both the court and the doctor. Had you finished your answer? I, I guess I have now. Have now or have not? I'm sorry. I have. I have. Doctor, this would be an area for an experienced forensic pathologist more than a doctor with your expertise and background. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Now, doctor, I want to move to the hand um, examination. And you have, I asked you before we started if you could take out your rough drawing. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Uh, doctor, would it uh, be of extreme difficulty to you if we mark your original as an exhibit and gave you a copy back for your file? That's fine. It, only because it's in pen, and I think it's going to be a little easier maybe for us, if that's okay with the court. Yes. Uh, your Honor, could uh, this document, as writing on both sides, be marked as People's Exhibit 514? 514. And I'll write in red to differentiate from the writing that's on it. 514 at the bottom of the side that has the L, which I assume represents the left hand. Mr. Farrow, you would put that up on the, I think the other way around. And if we could, let me give the doctor a copy that you previously provided to me. Doctor, does that appear to be a true and correct copy of the document that we have up on the Elmo? Yes, it does. Mr. Farrow, uh, well, just to begin with, the L at the top of the uh, diagram represents this is the left hand, correct? That's correct. Now, if we'll move down, you've got even a little more. Okay. Let me start with the last word at the bottom that says flubbing. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you previously testified on direct examination that um, even, in fact, I think in your report, Exhibit 507, made a finding of clubbing. Is that correct? That is correct. Doctor, would it be accurate to say clubbing is a situation, if you look at a profile of your fingernail, normally one sees the fingernail is lower towards the um, finger as it goes towards the wrist then it will be at the center and at the tip of the fingernail where we clip our fingernails. Correct. Normally the nail from the nail bed angulates slightly upward and clubbing you uh, take an initial downward path and scoop down. So in other words, it's, it's filled up at the lower part where the nail bed begins, if you Correct. will. Correct. At the nail bed, that becomes, when looking at the, the finger longitudinally, that's the highest point. And then the nail basically starts curving downward, where if you all look at your own nails, you can see that there's a slight angulation upward of a normal nail. Now, doctor, I've put on uh, the uh, Elmo with Mr. Fertlow's assistance one of the exhibits from 1249, which I believe you testified uh, on Friday represents the ring finger of Mr. Simpson's left hand. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, Mr. Fertlow is ahead of me. He's got an arrow just about where I'd like it. Is this a photograph that, in your opinion, demonstrates the phenomenon of clubbing? Yes, it is. And would you indicate, you said it normally it starts and it's a downward angle, isn't that correct? Yes. Does that appear to you, if Mr. Farrell will move to the left where the nail bed begins, mm -hmm. and then trace along a line towards the tip of the fingernail, mm -hmm. does that appear to you that the fingernail bed is actually rising slightly? No, it does not. That's, that appears to be clubbing to me. And doctor, if you believe that that is clubbing, how severe a case would you describe that as being? Uh, you don't rate clubbing. I certainly have never heard of any rating system for clubbing. Either it's kind of a yes or no answer. 
well, doctor, would it be of some assistance if, in fact, what you found was, let me withdraw the question by Mike. You've seen cases, have you not, doctor, of clubbing where it's clear that the, there's a sponginess material, whatever it is, that has raised the area where the nail bed begins much higher than we see in Mr. Simpson's finger in this photograph so that the angle is much more pronounced. Is that a fair statement? There are different levels of clubbing, yes. I'm not um, aware of a prognostic significance of that, so that's why I didn't. If, if a rheumatologist said that uh, if that is clubbing, it's of minimal significance, would you agree with that assessment? I think it's clubbing, and, and I'd basically agree with that. Would you agree, I'm not sure you've answered my question, that it would be of minimal significance? Uh, Just agree? I think that clubbing is a yes or no phenomenon, to the best of my knowledge, and uh, I may be off in uh, left field, but uh, no, I, I'm not aware of a uh, significant versus a non-significant clubbing in terms of looking at it. Certainly when you see somebody with clubbing, a lot of people are just born with it, and it's of no significance whatsoever. Occasionally it represents some other type of disease, occasionally pulmonary, uh, occasionally some other type of disease. So I think if you have clubbing, you make a note of it, and you look into possible causes uh, without saying, gee, that's a minimally significant clubbing, let's forget it, as compared to, gee, that's a, that's a significant clubbing, let's really work that up. So, no, I'm not aware of that differentiation. Doctor, if we could have Mr. Fairlow put back now what we're looking at, uh, that Exhibit 514, I believe it is, uh, and again, the left hand. On this hand-drawn sketch, you wrote information regarding three cuts that you identified to the left ring and middle finger of Mr. Simpson. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And doctor, uh, did you identify all cuts that you saw by naked eye examination on June 15th to those fingers? No, I didn't. You were asked on direct examination about three cuts. Do you recall that testimony? Correct. How many cuts in total did you identify on June 15th, 1994 to Mr. Simpson's left hand, wrist, arm? He had uh, basically a, the third cut there on the fourth finger had two components. It was one laceration, but on this initial picture, uh, there's mainly, if you look at the spatial relationship, there's uh, it, it looks, basically I put one slash there and it looks like it's not basically representing the inferior portion of what I kind of call the, the 3B part of that laceration. Um, that stayed that way basically because immediately on dictating my report after 48 hours and sending it in, uh, I to try to be a little bit uh, more clear, transferred these pictures over to uh, two right hands, and there was a, uh, it was a stereotypic uh, mistake. In other words, the, the right hand, I put the, the starting left cuts, and basically I could see immediately that that was incorrect, but obviously I didn't want to change any of the records, and so I kept this picture the same um, as well as um, the other, uh, description as well. You want to ask Mr. Perico to put from Exhibit 507 this drawing that is marked page 440. Now, Doctor, this is the form that you subsequently transferred the information to? That is correct. And basically, we're looking at an outline, uh, dorsal and palmar, of a right hand, but you are using this to represent a left hand. Is that correct? That's correct. And would it be accurate to say that what you have diagrammed on the second finger, the index finger Correct. of the right um, dorsal, back of the hand, the right side of this diagram, is correct. intended to reflect the ring finger of the left hand? That is correct. In other words, you would put whatever is identified there and if uh, Mr. Fairlow has the identifying carrot, and Mr. Harris is going to help us out. Thanks very much. If Mr. Fairlow will move it down to right, oh, to the left of that, please. That line right there. Correct. Doctor, that line there 
is inaccurately placed. Is that correct? It's accurately placed, but it should be elongated. I basically put a shorter laceration there than what was in fact there waiting for the pictures to return. You're well, right. excuse me, that is, is it not, the index finger of the right hand? That's correct. The injury it is to reflect is to the ring finger of the left hand. Isn't that correct? That is correct. The ring finger of the right hand would be, if Mr. Farrell will move the carrot directly horizontal and over one more, that is the ring finger of the right hand, is it not? That is correct. And if you wanted to put that um, cut that you identified on the index finger in right. the, on the correct finger, recognizing this is a right hand drawing for a left hand, right. that would be where it should be, right? That's correct. So it is improperly located by you on this form? Yes, it is. All right, doctor. Let's start, if we could, please. Thanks, Mr. Harris. I think we're going to ask Mr. Farrell to come back to Exhibit 514. With respect to your rough drawing, you do have it located, do you not, on the ring finger of the left hand? Yes, I do. What did you write down with respect to any description of that particular injury? And if you can't read it from, I'm talking about writing down on oh, this. OK. Um, now, I gave you a copy. That's why if you need to take a look at it, if you can't, Mr. Farrell, maybe you can uh, zoom in a bit. Partially healed edges with heme in between edges of cut and below uh, paper cut. I want to be clear, just what you started to read. Doctor, that doesn't refer to the index finger injury, does it? That refers to the injury on the middle finger. Isn't that correct? Correct. Paper cut slice. OK, let, let's start. Now you're going to tell us what you wrote for the ring finger left hand, correct? No. The index, the third finger left hand is slice angulated injury, about one centimeter. All right, is that to reference uh, what would be the lower uh, injury diagram to the far left of this particular diagram? Yes, it would. Okay. In fact, don't you have an arrow? Do you not have an arrow? And Mr. Fairlow, if you'll down, down, Mr. Fairlow, to the right, to the right, right there. That is the area, is it not, doctor, where you diagrammed in what you defined as an injury to the left ring finger. That's correct. And you have an arrow pointing to that, correct? That is correct. What, if any, hand, uh, I'm sorry, written entry did you make describing that injury? Uh, the written injury. The, on, on this document? On that document. None. So the where paper it says, cut slice angulated injury is discussing that lesion, uh, the distal part of the third finger. So where it says paper cut, that paper cut, and you see how the T of cut is just above the arrow that is pointing to the area of the injury in the left ring finger. Do you see that? Correct, yes. Is it your testimony, doctor, that paper cut there does not refer to that injury on the left ring finger? That is correct. All right. Now, paper cut then refers to the injury to the middle finger. Is that correct? That is correct. And now if Mr. Fertlow could move the diagram so maybe we can center on. Thanks, Mr. Harris. Let's start. I want to start with the paper cut, if we could. Mr. Fertlow, drop down, if you would, please. Now, what did you then write with respect to this down a little Mr. Farrell, with the arrow, please. For that injury, you notice you have, a, again, a carrot sign pointing to it? Yes. Now, what did you write then for that particular finding, doctor? Paper cut slice angulated injury. Did you write in any way that that was caused by glass? No, I did not. Did you write in any way that that was caused by a knife? No, I did not. But in fact, when Mr. Shapiro asked you on direct examination the cause of that particular injury, you said it was due to a sharp object, correct? 
That is correct. And in fact, you uh, indicated things like a metal object, right? Yes. Like a knife? Yes. Or glass? Yes. Not a paper cut, right? When I initially saw the wound, it was sliced so clean, that was what came into my head initially, and I did jot that down, absolutely. And so clean means it had no rough edges. Isn't that correct, doctor? That is the one cut that has no rough edges. And your testimony on Friday on direct exam was the absence of a rough edge would be more consistent with a knife. It was the presence of a rough edge on one of the injuries that led you to favor glass over a knife for that other injury. Isn't that correct? Both glass and knives can have smooth cuts. However, um, if you have a sharp cut, there's, there's no way of knowing. On that case, part of the reason why I thought that that was more consistent with glass was the fact that the wound appeared to me to continue directly over to the adjacent fourth index finger and that it was difficult after I really sat down and thought about it for me to, to believe or to think that this cut, which seemed to continue over it seemed more consistent with some type of irregularly shaped object, sharp object, than uh, a knife to be able to cause both of those seemingly related lacerations, if in fact they were related. Doctor, my question though to you was, on direct examination in response to Mr. Shapiro's question, you differentiated glass over a knife because of the rough edge of one of the cuts. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And your testimony here is that this other cut, this one you initially describe as a paper cut, does not have a rough surface, correct? That's absolutely correct. Doctor, did you try and age each of these injuries to form an opinion as to how old the injury was? I really did not. I have a mental picture of it, and obviously, much more important, I wanted to rely on the pictures that were taken. Well, doctor, your visual examination was the best examination. Pictures may be distortions in some respect. They may not, but they may be, right? I think pictures are going to tell this pretty accurately, I would certainly hope. All right, well, doctor, then, did you attempt to age these injuries? I don't really consider myself a pathologist to age injuries, but, I mean, if you want my opinion, absolutely. I mean, I, I attempted to see if the ages were relatively similar, if the erythema around the borders was similar, if the amount of clot inside, the degree of scabbing was similar, and it was difficult because the, the cuts were so dissimilar. One of them, the fissure cut on the third proximal interphalangeal joint, was a slice injury, and there was a significant amount of blood and heme there. The laceration on the distal third finger uh, which was the very smooth one, was wide open without anything inside. It was more superficial, and it was totally clean. The edges were not touching. As you well know, a wound heals much more quickly when the laceration goes in perpendicular to the uh, skin surface, and these were uh, beveled or angulated uh, lacerations. But it did appear to me that there was some continuity because right this smooth lesion, it came right over into this uh, third, uh, what I call the, the cut 3B, came right seemingly over in one fell injury and it seemed like some sort of sharp object uh, caused both of those and it, it, it made it a little bit more difficult in my mind to think that it was a knife, although certainly I never said that it couldn't be a knife. I said that it seemed more consistent with glass. But you said it was more consistent with glass because of the rough edge of that injury, correct? The rough edge of the injury, putting them both together, they seem to be a similar injury. Did you assume all of the injuries you saw on his left hand were incurred at the same time? I didn't make that assumption, and certainly, as I've described, uh, the wounds had different entry marks, and it was very difficult, certainly uh, not something that I have any expertise in in terms of exactly dating them, and that's why, in my mind, I was just to see Mr. Simpson, uh, 
I requested that the pictures be taken and that all these legal issues be handled by a qualified forensic pathologist because I knew full well that that wasn't something that I was going to be able to testify up here in front of court on because that's not what I do for a living. And when I made these drawings, I had no intention of answering any of these questions because I assumed uh, I would not be an expert and that I just wanted to make sure the pictures represented what I had remembered and I feel in that case they are. Did you tell Mr. Shapiro that you did not consider yourself an expert in identifying these kinds of injuries? In dating them, I think is what I said, in terms of exactly timing. This is not something that uh, I do as part of my practice in terms of looking at a wound and without, as you say, making the assumption that the patient is lying to me, exactly go back and date it somehow, whether it's carbon dating, uh, back centuries or back days, that isn't something that I do for a living and I don't even pretend uh, to offer any more than a sidewalk consultation on that. Well, doctor, though, as part of your training in the emergency room that you relied upon in being able to differentiate knife cuts from glass cuts, you would be involved in the same process with respect to when you got the injury. You asked the patients if they're conscious, able to talk, when would you get it, right? That's absolutely correct. And, and you also are in a situation where people will come after you put in some sutures to see how the wound is healing. Isn't that correct? That is absolutely correct. And that would be in situations where you would know based on patient history when the wound was inflicted, right? Assuming it was correct. accurately given. That is correct. And then you would know what's the condition of the wound at the time you're looking at it the next visit, right? That's a sutured wound, which is totally different than a gaping wound that's had bacterial infestation and that is cut at a variety of angles and that has totally different appearances in all of these cuts and has totally different healing qualities, different rates of epithelialization, different weights, rates of wound contracture, and uh, all these are very uh, difficult issues unless you've, you know, studied pictures and really made a science of this, which I certainly have not. Well, doctor, is it your testimony that you have never in your emergency room moonlighting over the years you've identified, never been dealing with patients who have the kind of cuts that you saw on Mr. Simpson's left hand at various stages of healing? Is that your testimony, sir? No, I have seen cuts at every different stage of healing, but I have not made a mental note, is this a cut one day old, two days old, three days old, four days old, or five days old? That's a very tight call. And um, short of evaluating a wound for its need or appropriateness of suturing, apart from evaluating a wound for its infected or non-infectious nature, apart from evaluating a wound for foreign bodies inside, um, in terms of dating it exactly, I, I don't think that that's something that I feel comfortable doing. I think that uh, I have seen a lot of people who I think were answering truthfully say I got cut by a knife slicing the bagel this morning or I got cut by glass washing the dishes uh, in the sink and I feel I have a general idea, a pretty good idea after all those years of recognizing the difference between glass and knife and I think it comes down to, and again this may be oversimplified, if there is a lot of erratic, shaggy edges, then it's probably not something perfectly sharp like a surgical blade or a razor blade or a knife. If there's some jagged edge, then it's more likely some other type of irregular but very sharp material. Right, let's move on. Uh, if I put one last question in this area. I, th I think we've covered this quite a bit now. All right. One last question. If the court feels it's in no. the same vein. Wind, then wind it up, but let's, let's move on. Doctor, if... Mr. Simpson's hand was moving at an angle to the instrument inflicting the injury. That could account for the roughness or shagginess of the edge. Isn't that correct, sir? It could account for... Objection. Oh, well, you can answer the question. If you are slicing with a knife and you move suddenly, you'd have to, in order to get a beveled edge, of course, you'd have to move smoothly, but you could get one or two large movements, theoretically. Which would give a shaggy appearance, correct? Not a shaggy appearance, maybe uh, maybe a, a change in direction of the laceration. Now, doctor, I want you to um, assume hypothetically the following, and you tell me whether any of your findings would be inconsistent with this. In fact, let me withdraw that. Did you ask Mr. Simpson when he got any of these injuries, when as in time? 
he got any of these injuries? Again, I, I think that this is maybe going to come as a shock to you, but I was asked to see him because of a, acute anxiety, situational problems, and to evaluate to make sure that medically he was okay. I took careful pictures of the hands. I asked him how he got the lacerations, which he said he got cut by glass. I did not exactly ask him the time. I didn't ask him whether or not he committed this crime. I didn't go into those items. That was for different people. He had a whole different set of, of people evaluating those things. This was not something where I saw myself as somebody that was going to be sitting here defending him in court. I was really seeing him as a doctor, taking pictures of anything abnormal that I saw, and not really evaluating him so that at some later date I would sit here to protect him or do anything else in a legal vein along the lines you're asking me currently. Your Honor, I have another photograph. May this be marked as Exhibit 515? 515. 515. Have you shown that to counsel? Uh, no, but it was given to me by the counsel. First. You may. Doctor, let me show you, and I wrote 515 on the back of the photograph, Your Honor. Doctor, are uh, you familiar with what's shown in that photograph? Yes, I am. And is that, in fact, a photograph taken on June 17, 1994? Yes, it is. And this is taken during the course of the subsequent examination uh, in which you were involved, is that correct? That is correct. And you're seen in this photograph, aren't you? Yes, I am. And is that Dr. Bodden that's also seen in the photograph? Yes, it is. What are you looking at, you and Dr. Bodden, looking at in this photograph? Uh, it's a stain or phrase question. Well, let's just put it up on the Elmo, preferably, preferably that way, yes. If we could back up just a little, Mr. Ferretlow, so we can see. Uh, just for clarification, looking to the left, that's Dr. Bodden, correct? Yes, it is. Looking to the right in the foreground with the glasses, that's you. Is that correct, Dr. Yes, Heisinger? And in the yellow shirt is Mr. Simpson? Yes, it is. And is that Mr. Simpson's right hand that appears to be uh, resting on, Mr. on Dr. Bodden's left palm? Yes, it is. Um, now, doctor, was this part of the more complete examination of the hands for injuries? This was a... Objection, though, Sustained. Doctor, what are the two of you doing in this photograph, then? Objection, irrelevant. Let me see counsel sidebar with the court reporter, please. Objection,
Proceed. Let me re-ask the question. I think I started with a question. Doctor, what are you and Dr. Bodden doing in this photograph? Objection, Dr. What are you doing in this photograph, Doctor? I think he just identified himself, Mr. Shapiro, in the Overruled. Counsel. You may answer the question, Doctor. What are you doing in this photograph? Looks like I'm just uh, standing there. I have no idea what I'm doing. Are you uh, uh, looking at anything in particular? I, ha I, I have no recollection of exactly what uh, I he might have been doing with that particular procedure. I think that what, what we did there was, as I said, uh, he and uh, Dr. Lee were present on the 17th um, and basically just to make sure that the correct photographs were taken, and again, they're the ones that were going to handle what the cuts were, what they meant, how to age them, uh, the entire hand was re-photographed. And I believe, if I had to take a guess what was going on, this was just a picture, I believe, taken by Dr. Lee that was the start of this whole process of re-examining his entire body with those two specialists there. Again, uh, no one wanted to uh, rely on, that wasn't really my role, and so at this point, they were re-photographing his entire hands as well as his entire body. Thank you, Your Honor. I think we're done with the photo. Let me ask Mr. Farrell then if you would please to put your rough sketch uh, 514 back up. Now, Doctor, let's, um, let me ask you if there is anything inconsistent from your examination that the injuries that you've identified in this drawing could have been caused by different sources at different times. I think that's possible. Oh, you can you answer, the answer the question, doctor. I think it's possible, but again, it was difficult because the injuries were of quite different nature, as I explained before. And so while they could all have been incurred at the exact same moment, they also could have been at a slightly different time. Again, the time frame of one or two days, certainly with my expertise, would be very difficult for me to tell the difference when you have cuts that have different entry angulation and therefore different healing rates. You also, of course, the healing is dependent on how much uh, laxity there is in the, in the skin. So depending on where it, it, the laceration is in the finger in terms of is there motion on that joint? Is it an area where there's really no motion? Is it an area over the third finger where there's swollen joints and so obviously the skin will be pulled back? Uh, all those factors, even if, if everything were uh, cut exactly the same moment, it could appear, I would think, absolutely uh, difficult, and the healing rate could be quite different. I think all of us have had the experience where you get multiple cuts, and some heal much quicker than others. Uh, typically, the ones over your joint will be the one that just keeps breaking open and bleeding you know, for extended periods. Doctor, would it be then fair to say, though, that given the different nature of appearance, uh, between the three cuts that are identified in this hand-drawn sketch, that that is suggestive that the injuries may have been caused by different sources? It's very difficult to say. It's very difficult to say, but there's, there's various theories because if you take, take a hand where the majority of the injuries are right here, right here, and uh, right here on the left hand, and then as we discussed before, there's a fine uh, abrasion uh, right here, and you kind of had some system like that, and, and the injuries are kind of along this ray, it could be possible that they were all caused at the same time by the same substance as well. For the record, the doctor took his left hand, and with the um, palms up, he made a up and down motion, I think several times, Your Honor, with that forearm and hand, as if doctor to represent striking some surface? Is that That's correct? Some surface or some sharp thing, correct. Now, doctor, if that had been the situation, wouldn't you expect to see contusions to the areas along the knuckles that come in contact with the hard surface in the action that you just demonstrated? 
again, it's very difficult depending on the force of the blow. And number two, depending on whether, you know, someone um, strikes something that is sharp right up front or uh, somebody basically rubs their hand over this sharp surface, that, that's a tough call. Your Honor, I have another photograph. Uh, may this be marked, it's a color photograph, uh, what appears to be the left hand. May this be marked as 516? Yes. And perhaps reduce the glare in some fashion. And I'm going to be asking you, Mr. Fairlow, if you can focus more on the uh, wrist area for the moment. Exactly, that's perfect. And if you can also do some kind of carrot. Exactly, if you move it down, straight down. Straight down, please. And now to the left. And a, a little more. And down just a tad, right there. Doctor, do you see where the arrow has stopped here? Yes, I do. You testified at the end of your direct examination by Mr. Shapiro that you did identify a couple of abrasions. You described them as punctate abrasions. Is that correct? There were a number of abrasions, uh, I believe, the punctate ones were more, you can see them right on, as I look at this picture, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a dot and then another dot. Those were the punctate lesions. And then there were several other, these other small abrasions, which were, you know, more uh, in the, I think, something like a quarter by an eighth inch and a, a, an eighth by an eighth. First of all, let me ask you, uh, if this was your testimony, page 366 of the um, real-time transcript, other than those on the 15th referring to the cuts that you've already testified to, there was no other evidence of any trauma except for several very small little punctate abrasions that were also on the back of his left palm, but they were appeared to be basically zigzag areas of maybe several centimeters, which were very superficial irritation scrapings of some sort. Do you recall that testimony? Uh, yes, I do. Did that testimony refer to what we are seeing under the carrot here? That did include those areas. There's, there's, a, there's a, a straight area you can't see on this picture, and then there are these several dots, and then there are these other two areas, yes. Doctor, would you describe this as the back of the left palm? As yes, you, I would. All right. And that is an abrasion, is that correct? Yes, it is. Is that uh, an injury? That's a blunt force trauma type of injury, correct? It could be a blunt force, but more likely some sort of a scrape or well, let, let's assume Dr. Lakshmanan has testified that blunt force trauma is a category of certain kinds of injuries which includes uh, abrasions, contusions, lacerations. Any reason to disagree with that uh, analysis? Or will you may answer the question, doctor. Say that one more time. Let me hear if that. If Dr. Lakshmanan testified that blunt force trauma is a generalized category of types of injuries that includes abrasions, contusions, and lacerations, would you have any reason to disagree with that? No, I wouldn't. And as he also testified, I'll ask you to assume that an abrasion is a scraping type action. Is that consistent with what you identified on what appears to be the lateral side of the uh, little finger where, uh, of the uh, area near the little finger's base of the left wrist? Right, it's actually over the carpal bones on the uh, left side, the ulnar side of the, the, the carpal bones, yes. That's one abrasion? Correct. And did that appear to be uh, of the same vintage age-wise as the cuts that you were looking at on the uh, third and fourth fingers of Mr. Simpson's left hand? The finger cuts were still open, and this appeared to be somewhat more healed uh, on the 15th. But an abrasion doesn't have the appearance of a cut, does it, doctor? No, it does not. And so the fact that a cut is open is not relevant to the degree of healing of an abrasion. Isn't that correct? That's correct. All right. If, uh, Mr. Ferretlow, could can you circle that, please, Mr. Ferretlow? So we'll call that abrasion number one, just for keeping account, if we could. Mr. Ferretlow, would you move the arrow to the right? 
along the, uh, oh, okay, you do it that way. A little further, there, look, right there. Now, doctor, is that another abrasion that you identified on June 15th? Yes, it is. And, in fact, in your diagram, is this going to really... Uh, no, I'll tell you what, before we get to the diagram. Did it appear to be of about the same vintage as the first abrasion? Yes, it did. And if Mr. Fairlow could circle that. May I approach again, Your Honor? You may. Doctor, showing you this diagram that we already had up from Exhibit 507, did you write in on that form the location and description of those two things we're looking at on this photograph, Exhibit 515. Yes, I did. What uh, was your measurement of what we've described here as abrasion number one, the one that is closer to the fingers? I put that that was approx the, the closer to the fingers. Yes. Approximately one centimeter. And one centimeter, you said uh, on Friday you thought was 2.2 uh, centimeters to the inch. And we'll, I think we'll correct that to 2.54. Um, so it's basically... A um, third of an inch, maybe? A third of an inch. And how about uh, abrasion number two? Did you measure that one? Yes, I did. How long was that one? I marked it was approximately a half of a centimeter. So that's about a sixth of an inch? Correct. Doctor, uh, in your opinion, was each of those consistent with some kind of scraping, such as, for example, a fingernail? didn't appear to be a fingernail, but obviously if you catch a fingernail flush, uh, that would be a possibility. But typically you're looking for some kind of a curve. You know, we see obviously a lot of fingernails in the eyeball. I guess that's where I've had the most experience, where you can see that characteristic curvature. And, um, you know, usually scrapes on the skin are a little wider than, you know, the scrape he had, but that certainly was something that uh, I entertained. Well, Doctor, let me ask you hypothetically, to assume that Dr. Lakshmanan testified that he identified on Mr. Goldman's neck two superficial incise wounds, semi-parallel in nature, uh, running along the front of his neck. All right? Okay. Assume that. And further, that he offered an opinion that those two superficial incise wounds were consistent with being inflicted by a person holding a knife in the right hand who had Mr. Goldman from behind controlled with a left arm around the chest area. Do you have a pretty good picture of that? Yes. And in such a situation, doctor, would it be accurate to say that the area that you see the two abrasions in this photograph would be exposed to the outside if it's in the position that I've got right here, a bar arm type of hold across the chest? I think that is a possibility. You'd really have to rotate it out because you, you see this ulnar styloid is sticking out right here. And so, you know, you really have to, let's see, you're saying, let's no, get the hand right, the, left hand. The left hand, the left arm. I want you to assume. And with well, the it's going to take me a little time to work this out. I'm not going to just do this instantly. I, I think we can help you with it. Your Honor, with the court's permission, could Dr. Um, Isinger step down, please? Yes. And Dr. if you will take on a role that I played a little earlier in this trial, and perhaps you could face the jury. And I'm going to represent Dr. Lakshmanan by putting my arm, I don't have as long an arm as he had, around your chest. And that he then, with his right arm, holding, appearing to hold a knife, made some slashing uh, gestures with his right hand to represent how haunting type of parallel cuts could be inflicted. Mm -hmm. You with me so far? Yes. All right, now, in this position that I'm in, would it be correct to say, I've got a watch on that, let me take the watch off. Would it be correct to say, doctor, that the area of Mr. Simpson's hand and wrist and arm where we see those two abrasions would be in this position to the outside of Mr. Golden? Objection causes speculation. Overruled. You may ask the question, Doctor. Just as I've got my hand in this position. It's possible, but if you just in this position, I still feel your owner styloid sticking out a little bit right here. So I still think you could abrade this area, but then why didn't you abrade this area if you got this area? Because you almost have to be like this somehow to get both of those. And if you're 
coming in, curving toward me, you're sticking out this ulna styloid. What if I'm not curving, doctor, but I've got you like, I've got you now where I am applying the pressure, and well, I think then, verify the pressure is being applied right here, is it not? Mm -hmm. And this area is up. I just wanted to ask you. I hope he's not hurting the doctor. Not in the slightest. Am I, doctor? <laughs> no. Doctor, yeah, the question, he's, though, he's was. He's a wrestler counselor. <laughs> I'm sure he could throw me in a second, Your Honor. Yes. The question, doctor, and this is the only question. Is this area that is on the outside of your body the area that is depicted in the photograph that's up on the Elmo? Yes, it is. All right. Now you can retake the stand. Thank you. And, doctor, if Mr. Goldman was trying to get the knife or the arm that's holding the knife at his throat away from him and he's uh, grappling, to try and get free, would you agree, doctor, that if he rubs along the left uh, edge of the left hand of the perpetrator, if that position of the perpetrator's arm was as I demonstrated, that that could be a source for such abrasions? Overall. Certainly, abrasions could be caused by that type of emotion, whether or not they would be in that exact location. Again. I would have to uh, look at the exact dimensions of Mr. Simpson's arm. And, you know, this is like a lot of medicine. You have to do a test. You know, that's, that's what science is all about. You have to do a test. What test did you do to see Mr. Simpson ever attempt to run, to see how well he could run? Did you ever ask him to run at any time? I never asked him to run. And that would be the best test, would it not, to see how well he could run given his arthritic condition as you found it? He told me he could not run, and you're right. I took him at his word. Uh, Your Honor, I think we're up to, is it 517? 517. I have another photograph that appears to show the left arm. May that be marked as that designation? And I've written it on the back. Uh, could we, and focus more again on the back of the hand at the moment rather than on the fingers. Great. And Mr. Ferretlow, can you take an arrow again and about in the center of the photograph, bring it down? Right, a little further down, please. Doctor, do you see where the uh, arrow is right now on this exhibit 517? Yes, I do. Did you observe that particular finding at the time of your June 15th examination? Yes, I did. Did you form an opinion as to what that represented? No, I did not. Would you agree that you did not describe it anywhere on your rough uh, diagram, which we marked as Exhibit 514? That's this. No, I would disagree with that. All right, would you, let me show you. You tell me then where you mark these in. Right here. These lines right there. Okay. What do these other lines mean? And we'll get these, this up so everybody can see. Um, those were the little, the, the ditzels that we were talking about. The ditzels? Which yeah. are the ditzels? Um, immediately to the right of that linear area. And then there's uh, one back behind that. Again, those were just to make me remember to look at those on the pictures, but they were definitely there. Did you ever write a report describing what those things were? Uh, I'm sorry, yes, if we could put the Exhibit 514 up. We'll come back to the photograph just so everybody can see what you've described. And, Doctor, why don't you point out, if you wouldn't, and maybe Mr. Farrell will circle it. Direct him if you can. These areas right here, and there's a, a dot. Again, there is a little area right there. These were areas that, again, I was counting 
totally on the pictures to document those. I was putting those down as a self-reminder, taking the exact pictures. I can't draw. It's all very misleading. This wasn't what I intended to do diagrammatically, and I wanted to have pictures be the record for that, and that's why I had pictures taken. Doctor, do you still have the, your original report that we marked? Yes. I'm sorry, that's yours. I think this is the one I need. <coughs> Mr. Farrell, would you put up uh, again page 440? And for the record, Mr. Farrell drew some circles around the area that the doctor had pointed out on his rough diagram. Yes. Now, doctor, this is the more complete diagram, and if Mr. Farrell will raise it just a bit, could you raise it just so we see the bottom? At the bottom, you drew in, or wrote in, and maybe you could raise it even further, Mr. Farrell, and we'll focus on just right at the end. There we go. We're looking at now those two areas of abrasion Correct. that were seen in the photograph. We were looking at 516, I think it is. Correct. All right. Now, if we'll bring the rest of the schematic into view, did you draw in any of those little lines that you drew in in your rough diagram? Yes, I did. And uh, would you indicate where they are? There's a zigzag line and then those various dots down below. All right. If you'll direct Mr. Farrell. This was intended to be the abrasion and then these various dots that represented these various other uh, punctate lesions, again, that I was doing as a mnemonic, uh, assuming that uh, these were all going to be replaced by the photos and that this was just something that would... Uh, where, where Miss... I'm sorry. That this was something that would then just... Uh, keep the whole issue fresh in my mind. Where Mr. Farrellow has the uppermost arrow, you said that was, in your opinion, an abrasion? That was the linear laceration. Laceration or abrasion, doctor? Linear abrasion. And let's uh, ask Mr. Farrellow, you can print that out? Sure, why don't you print that out? And now I'll ask you to put up 517 again. And again, focusing on that, bring the arrow over, if you would, please, Mr. Farrellow, to the right, right there. Is that, doctor, what you are now describing as this abrasion? The linear abrasion, correct. All right. Now, doctor, um, if Mr. Simpson had had a glove on his left hand, that area would, in your opinion, be covered if the glove were still being worn, would it not be the situation? It would be difficult to get this sort of abrasion unless there was something inside the glove, if in fact your, your premise of wearing a glove were correct, yes. But if the glove had been forcibly removed, this area of the hand would be exposed, is that correct? Sustained. Sustained. Doctor, I want you to assume hypothetically that Mr. Simpson did murder Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Sustain. Phrase the question. I want you to assume, Doctor, hypothetically no. that the no that the, per that the perpetrator of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman wore gloves, left and right hand. That in the effort to perpetrate the murder, he lost the left glove exposing the hand as we see it in this photograph. You with me so far on this hypothetical? Yes, I am. And that in the course of Mr. Goldman trying to get the knife in the right hand of the perpetrator away from his neck, that he scratched the perpetrator's uh, left hand that was being used to control him, much like I demonstrated with you earlier this afternoon. Do you have that assumption? Objection. Oral. Do you have that assumption in mind, doctor? Yes, I do. Again, would this be consistent, in your opinion, with an injury received by Mr. Simpson under such a hypothetical set of circumstances? Uh, 
can I see some pictures of that cut so that I can sure, just make sure the right to left? Because you'd think for if then if his right hand. For the record, I'm giving the witness exhibit 517. Yes. That would be a possibility. That would be a possibility? I'm sorry. That would be a possibility. May I recollect? Uh, Doctor, I'm going to just ask you collectively regarding these other injuries. But to do so, let me mark some additional photographs, and I'll show them to you collectively. Um, seven additional photographs of the left uh, wrist or hand area. May they be marked uh, collectively 518A through whatever the next letter would be? Yes. And then what appear to be two photographs of the right hand. I'm sorry. I need to add one more of the left hand to the collection. A photograph of the right hand that I'd ask to be marked uh, as Exhibit 5... 19. 19. 19. May I approach... The, uh, there are two of them. I'm sorry. I was right the first time. 519A and B. Fine. May I approach the witness? You may. Doctor, would you look at the Exhibit 518A through wherever it's going to end? And basically, as you're looking at them, my question to you is, do each of these photographs fairly and accurately show the left hand, wrist, or arm near the area of the wrist of Mr. Simpson as of the time you saw him on June 15th and June 17th, 1994. Excuse me? No, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and look at the photographs. Mr. Kelberg? Well, I certainly accept the stipulation as required under defense discovery, but the question was, do these fairly and accurately represent <coughs> the areas depicted as of the time seen by Dr. Heisinger on June 15th and June 17th, 1994. Proceed. And that's the purpose I asked you to look at them, Doctor. Have you had a chance to review each of them? Yes, I have. Does each of those photographs fairly and accurately show the area depicted in each of the photographs as seen by you on June 15th and June 17th, 1994? The areas of the injuries are similar, correct. And basically, do the photographs fairly show them? In other words, it's not a distortion, what we're looking at. No, I don't believe these are distorted. Now, doctor, let me add two other photographs Oh, I'm sorry, this one's been marked. I'm not sure that this one has. Just to be on the safe side, another one to add to the 518 collection, Your Honor. All right. Of the left hand. Uh, same question to you, Doctor. Does that fairly and accurately show the area of the left hand, back of the left hand, as you saw it on June 15th and uh, June 17th? Yes, it does. And let me show you then the two photographs marked 519 A and B and ask you basically the same question regarding the right, the back of the right hand. Yes, it does. Doctor, with respect to the left hand, how many 
injuries, and I will include cuts, abrasions together. How many injuries did you see on June 15th on Mr. Simpson? Whether you diagrammed them in or you have to go on the basis of the photographs, and let me give you the photographs and you can look through them to count if necessary. He sustained an injury to his proximal interphalangeal joint that we've discussed. He sustained uh, an injury to the distal third uh, interphalangeal joint. He sustained a injury that appeared to be continuous but did have kind of a mid a mid break area uh, on the fourth basically from the uh, D the distal to the proximal interphalangeal joint let me stop you if you're done with that description because we have a photograph and I'm going to ask you this is one of the defense exhibits uh, 1249 that's correct all right doctor if Mr. Fairlow can get us the arrow again, why don't you trace for us on this photograph the course that you're talking about? And I think you may need to bring it. There you go, Mr. Fairlow. Basically, it's difficult to see here, at least at my angle, but the incision, the laceration starts here, and there appear to be kind of a continuous sinoidal pattern right here. It seemed to be one injury to me at the time. That was my initial impression. In looking at this photograph or any of the other photographs, has your opinion changed as to whether or not, in fact, this may be the product of separate injuries? Um, I still think that it's, uh, it, it's, it's a continuing type of uh, injury. Now, we could go on, and Mr. Farrell, you could print that out perhaps. And Your Honor, could the printout just be added to the defense exhibit of 1249? You want to make it a people's exhibit? Then it's uh, 520. 520. We're done with the photo. All right, five minutes, Mr. Gilbert. Okay. Any other on the left? Any oh. others on the left? Um, and then we had the abrasion that we noted here. We had um, May I approach your honor? As I recall, three punctate lesions. A lesion being an injury? An injury, a kind yeah. of a small circular area. And let me have, Your Honor, just to be on the safe side, could this be 519A, so we'll be able to identify, 518A, excuse me. All right. Mr. Carlo, will you put that up so we can all see what the doctor is looking at? And we're going to focus down towards the arm from where we saw that linear abrasion. Is that correct, doctor? That is correct. And if Mr. Fairlow gets the arrow, up to the right, to the right, to the right, up, right there. Is that one of the injuries, the punctate lesions as you described it? Yes, it is. And is that consistent with an abrasion, punctate abrasion, much like uh, you described the other as being a linear abrasion? Of some sort. Did they appear to be in approximately the same state of healing? Yes, they did. Are there any other uh, abrasions as seen in this photograph, 518A? Yes, there's one below that and a little bit off to the right. All right, if we can lower the arrow you, to the right, down further, Mr. Ferretlow, perhaps, to the right. To the right. Right there about, doctor? Correct. And is that a similar punctate abrasion? Yes, it is. Anything else in this photograph? I don't see anything in that photograph. Mr. Fair, look at print this, perhaps. And Your Honor, 518 AA as the printout. Yes. Any other 
doctor. There was, you know, on, on one of the pictures here, there were three, that's why I said it, but they were very, the other one was uh, somewhat smaller than that. Why don't you show me which photograph we can put it up? These, I believe, were the two that you have um, just mentioned, and there was, I don't really see it on this picture. Let me ask you to look actually at one of the. I don't see it on this picture the large photographs of the left hand, and I'll make this one 518B. Do you see what appears to be some kind of injury on the thumb? Yes, I do. Was that one of the injuries you saw? No, it was not. Uh, was it, do you know when this photograph was taken? That, as I have no idea. As between the 15th or the 17th, we stipulated this has been provided by defense counsel. Can you tell us when? Um, that looks like the 15th. And Mr. Farrell, could you put this 518B up and see if we can see this injury on the thumb area? You're going to, there we go. Do you want to switch perhaps the other direction, Mr. Farrell? No, I mean with the thumb vertical. I'm sorry. And down. And about in the uh, halfway down from the thumbnail, Mr. Farrell, with an arrow. You have no recollection, doctor, of seeing that uh, injury on the 15th? Uh, that was one of the things I didn't indicate and uh, on the initial evaluation. It obviously was there if that's the 15th, but I didn't make a note of that. I didn't hear the last part. I'm sorry. I didn't make a note of that, and I, I haven't seen this picture ever before. And, doctor, um, in looking at the picture, do you have an opinion as to whether this is a cut or an abrasion? It appears also to be an abrasion of some sort. Any other injuries, doctor, to the left hand? The two that we discussed near the ulnar styloid. Any others? No, that's, that's everything. Let me show you the right hand photos. We have two photos of the right hand, 519A and B. In the photos, do you see any cuts or abrasions? No, I don't see any cuts or abrasions here. Do you see, you described, I think, seeing a paper cut on the 17th that you didn't uh, initially see on the 15th. Is that accurate? No, that's not accurate. You saw a paper cut at the tip of one of the fingers on the right hand. Is on the 15th and the 17th. Same one, though? Same one. Okay. And you have no idea when that was received uh, age-wise, do you? No, I basically asked how he got the cuts, and he said he cut it on glass, and I basically did not pursue that. And that included the right hand paper cut on the end of the particular finger? Is that a yes? That is a yes. Your Honor, uh, does the court wish to take a break at this yes. point? Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take our mid-afternoon break. Please remember all my admonitions to you, and we'll stand in recess for 15. Doctor, you can step down and return in 15. Parties are again present. Uh, Deputy McNair, let's have the jurors, please. Excuse me, Your Honor. Does it work when I hatch up the video? Because I've got maybe two more minutes, three more minutes of questioning before we get to the video. All right. Your Honor, there are several videos. First video involves this exercise workout. We have a video that is of the tape, uh, taping sessions. You can divide it into two categories. The first part, which I think is roughly 40 minutes, is Mr. Simpson doing take after take of the introduction, uh, running through the, for lack of a better term, spiel, that is going to be the introduction for the actual exercise portion of the take. The remaining little less than an hour are the takes of the exercise itself. I have no problem if Mr. Shapiro wants the whole video shown, although I think, quite frankly, the first 40 minutes of the spiel, take after take, is not really terribly relevant to this witness except for hand movements. But I would intend to start with the exercise portion and let the jury see the exercise portion, which is directly relevant to this witness, who has testified with respect to what he believes to be limitations on the part of Mr. Simpson 
um, characterizing them as the court well has heard over the last day and a half or so. So that would be the way I would intend to go. There is then the commercial product that is produced, which is cut, of course, from uh, the taping segments, and which includes some things that are not in the taping segment. As an offer of proof, Mr. Shapiro uh, was interested in an offer of proof. Uh, the um, well, Your Honor, it'll be laid on rebuttal. Obviously, I can't lay a foundation at this time for this witness, but I can certainly make an offer of proof to the court that we will lay a foundation which permits this to be used to question this witness. I don't think we are required to bring, um, oh, by the way, I've been told by Ms. Clark, the trainer who's involved in this was subpoenaed by the defense for Wednesday. But uh, setting even that aside, the law does not require us to lay the foundation first. We can make an offer of proof that we will lay the foundation. Mr. Walker is, in fact, the photographer. He was present for all three days, May 25th, May 26th, May 27th of 1994, roughly 16 days, 17 days, 18 days before the murders. He was the director of photography for the videotaping of an aerobic exercise production <coughs> featuring Mr. Simpson. The taping lasted approximately 12 to 16 hours. The second and third day consisted of videotaping Simpson, Mr. Simpson swinging a golf club and playing basketball. Some of that is in the commercial uh, tape that is sold to the public. Um, that's the foundation, that we, and that this fairly inaccurately, this videotape fairly inaccurately um, depicts the um, takes of the aerobic exercises. Seems to me that that's uh, the foundation we need to lay, and we will be able to lay it when it is our opportunity to call a witness uh, in our rebuttal case. All right, but, so you have Mr. Walker who's going to testify to all these things. Yes, and that I've been reading from a summary of an interview with Mr. Walker at 10 o'clock this morning. And this was at my request to Mr. Yokelson because, again, I got involved later on in the process, and uh, it was my request that, that Mr. Walker be interviewed. All right, what other videos are you going to show besides those two? There is one other video that involves a motivational speech made by Mr. Simpson on March 31 of 1994 at the Juice Plus convention in Dallas. And the portion, which I believe is the only portion relevant, and under 356 the remainder is not, deals with Mr. Simpson's comments regarding his health. And I do have a transcript of that if the court wishes to take a look at it. And what is your offer as to the foundation for this tape? Um, the foundation for this is an interview with Mr. J uh, Albert J. Martin, president of National Safety Association, the distributor for Juice Plus, uh, who's uh, the one who identified Mr. Simpson as the speaker at this convention. And this is the speech that he gave. And that this videotape is a videotape of that speech given by the defendant on May 31st? I, I believe it, in the summary of the interview that was done, and this is before I got involved, so it, it was a taped interview, but I did not have an opportunity for input on the questions of Mr. Martin. The statement from Mr. Martin says, In March, he spoke at our conference in Dallas, Texas. This is a self-authenticating tape, Your Honor, because Mr. Simpson is speaking. I would represent to the court, uh, and the court can look at the video if there's any question or read the transcript, that it's clear that this is, in fact, uh, what Mr. Martin is talking about, Mr. Simpson as a motivational speaker at a Juice Plus convention in uh, Dallas. You said this is in March or in May? This is March. March. The motivational speech is March 31, 94. And uh, for the record, what, uh, and I'll give you the full transcript, um, Mr. Simpson talks about um, his arthritis. I was at a time where I was having a pretty tough time because I got hit by what they might call, some of you might have it, it's rheumatoid arthritis. I had the first, the beginnings of rheumatoid arthritis. I was really having, I was having really a tough time. I actually had mornings where I could not open my door. I could not turn my wrist because my wrist, my fingers, my elbows would all get swollen up. They had me on, you name it, Napacin, 
Henderson, Motrin. I, I had so much Motrin, you couldn't believe it, you know. Every day, this was my life. My neighbor's a guy named Frank Job, who may be the greatest orthopedic surgeon in the world. He's the guy that rebuilt Tommy John's arm and stuff. He's telling me about this simple little operation that they can do with both my wrists to relieve some of the pain. And I know this is something we don't really get into with this product, uh, we can't really talk about. So when he's telling me about all this stuff and I'm thinking about it, because one thing I can't do anymore, I had gone to a nutritionist, is drink orange juice. And he talks about why he can't drink orange juice. Um, and I was one of these guys that drink a quart of orange juice every day. So as he's telling me about it, I said, you know, I'm going to have to try this stuff. And uh, the stuff is the Juice Plus. I said, I'll call home and get them to send it to me. He said, no, I got it right here. He had a whole bag of it right there. So for the next few months, along once again with changing my diet and stuff, I started taking regularly uh, Juice Plus and started feeling, I don't know if it was mind over matter, if it was a mental thing, but almost immediately I started feeling better. All of a sudden, I was starting to get another 10 yards on my drive, and having viewed the video, Mr. Simpson makes a gesture as if he's swinging a golf club. When I was, and then before I knew it, I just start skipping the Napacin, and skipping the Indocin, and skipping the pain pills, uh, the Advil. All I right. mean, I was one of these guys who was on six or seven Advils a day, you know, until today when I don't have to take anything. And my thought at the time was, I contacted Smokey, who is... All right, Mr. Kelberg, the two issues are foundation for the tape, and whether or not something in March of 94 is relevant to issues in June of 94. Those are the two concerns I have. Well, I think, Your Honor, the question is, as a foundational fact, a 403 preliminary fact, as to whether it's relevant. That is, is there any tendency and reason for a rational fact finder, a juror, to say that if, in fact, Mr. Simpson is claiming he had an arthritic problem before, but he changed his diet, and he's on this Juice Plus, and he's feeling great, that that is relevant to assess whether he was capable less than two months later of murdering these two people. I think, given that it is a foundational fact which is at the lowest level of the burden of, uh, of introducing evidence, that it clearly is relevant. It does have a tendency and reason. We've heard Dr. Um, Heisinger talk about Mr. Simpson coming in on the 15th walking like Tarzan's grandfather. And we've got Mr. Simpson less than two months earlier saying he's feeling great. He's off the drugs. He does, he's getting 10 yards more on his golf swing. It'll be for the jury to decide. It may well be that the jury decides Mr. Simpson was lying to those people at that convention. That, in fact, maybe he did have intermittent uh, episodes of arthritis. But the fact he would lie is itself relevant. Lie with respect to his condition. When one is evaluating whether he played through pain and was willing to lie if necessary when it was to his advantage, or whether he would be fully candid, in which case if he was, he wasn't having a problem less than two months earlier. So under either circumstance, it's relevant. And I submit, given what I've indicated and given what the document itself will show, document in the generic sense, I think, of evidence code section uh, 250, 240, a writing, uh, including a videotape, that uh, it's self-authenticating. But Mr. Martin, I'm certain, given the summary of the interview that I've uh, indicated to the court, uh, would be able to say this is the speech that Mr. Simpson gave March 30, 31 of 1994. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, with regard to the minimum or minimal maintenance video that uh, Mr. Simpson participated in, it is our position that if it is played, it should be played in its entirety. The com are we talking about the commercial product? No. That's the what Mr. Kelberg has incorrectly referred to as an aerobic or exercise video. is more a geriatric uh, type of uh, maintenance that uh, Mr. Simpson endorsed and uh, does not perform very well in. We, if that is shown, it should be shown from the beginning to the end without any breaks. And all of the outtakes that were done should be shown to the jury so they can see all the rest periods, all the breaks that had to be taken, all the reshooting that had to be done, where you will see uh, probably the most strenuous thing is uh, a series of a minimal amount of push-ups with stress and uh, done improperly. Uh, as far as videos of him playing basketball, we would like to see those. The only 
thing that we know is there is a one picture of him taking one shot, making one basket. I don't know that they have videos of him playing basketball. If they have videos of him in a basketball game, they have not provided them to us in discovery. And the outtakes that they have, we do not have, and we'd like to see them before they're shown. Now, we have provided the defense last week. Uh, Mr. Lynch, I believe, uh, made arrangements to have the copies made of Mr. Parrott, well, one of the two, of uh, all of these videotapes to provide the defense. The um, product for sale is the one that has three. When were they provided? When? Late last week is my understanding. They were given to Mr. Armstrong. They were provided to Mr. Armstrong, who is our conduit. Mr. Armstrong is an investigator with our office, Mr. Shapiro. Apparently this was litigated, Ms. again, I wasn't around for the opening statements, but Ms. Clark says this was litigated during the course of the opening statement. I have no way of knowing one way or the other. No, I'm just curious. My only question is when were the copies of both tapes that you want to play given to the defense, or all three tapes? My understanding would be late last week, and that's because I got involved with this late last week. And to whom were they given? They would have to, uh, that information would have to come from Mr. Armstrong because Mr. Armstrong is our conduit to filter all information to the defense for discussion. Mr. Douglas? Mr. Douglas does inform me that we did receive two videotapes and we'll have to review those if those uh, are, as Mr. Lynch represents, the entirety of uh, three days of outtakes. They should be quite lengthy and I don't know how they would fit on two videos. This, first of all, is that's not accurate by Mr. Shapiro. And just out of deference to the young men and women who are exercising in this video, I don't think anyone would describe them as being in the geriatric class. Uh, these are people in the 20s. Yeah, and that's, that, that, it's not helping me here. The issue is the offer of proof and the, whether or not you're going to play the whole thing in its entirety. That's all Your I'm Honor, this it has been represented to me to be the aerobic uh, exercise segment, the taping of that. It appears to have been all on one day. You'll see the time in the videotape. It is approximately one hour long. There are like three takes of one set of exercises, I think two takes of another set of exercises. There is before that this 40 minute or so period where Mr. Simpson is going through the introduction, the promotional. We're gonna have the doctor sit through all this? No, well? I am not suggesting that, Your Honor. Mr. Shapiro is the one, he says, let's play it all the way through. I believe that the only relevant portion to the doctor is the physical exercise that Mr. Simpson is engaging in, which is the period of about an hour that and occurs after the 40 minutes. And, and that's why I have it racked up. You have it queued up to that? I do, Your Honor. Right. Any other comment, Mr. Yes, Shapiro? the video that I reviewed, uh, unless it's something different, is 70 minutes. And in order to get a proper perspective, it should be shown from beginning to end because Mr. Simpson goes through numerous cycles and he talks about how to exercise in the office, how to exercise on an airplane, how to exercise sitting down. And it will be very important for the jury to see what his exercise regimen is like. Uh, as far as the outtakes, they should be played definitely in their entirety because as the court is well aware, when uh, commercial videos are made, they're made like movies. And they are cut in sequence. It's not just 70 minute shot and they, they put it on tape for commercial distribution. All right, thank you, counsel. All right, I'll accept the offer of proof from the prosecution that they can in fact lay a, a sufficient foundation for the auth authenticity of the tapes and the manner in which they were made. Uh, the prosecution is not required to play the tapes in their entirety for the purposes of cross-examination. However, under 356, the defense may, on redirect, play it from beginning to end, if they so choose. Your Honor, I would, just to save time, we will so choose. So rather than start at once and then have to play the whole thing, we would have asked the court to uh, have it shown in its entirety, and the jury can be told it's at the defense request. Your Honor, what I would suggest is I will play the exercise portion first, and then we can play the introduction, but uh, the exercise is clearly what is the relevant portion to the I agree. Process. All right, I ruled. Let's have the jurors for another 30 minutes. Doctor, looks like we're going to see you again tomorrow. Six o'clock, so we will finish. Uh, Your Honor, just for the record, the printouts from the uh, Elmo, there Find are several that needed to be <coughs> identified. One is 518 double B. 
of the um, right, let's, let's take that up after we've concluded with the jury. Let's do that after we let's let's try to squeeze what little we can out of the jury this afternoon. to reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Dr. Robert Heisiger is again on the witness stand. Mr. Kelberg. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, uh, during the recess, did you count the number of abrasions that you identified on the left hand or wrist area of Mr. Simpson? Yes, I did. How many separate abrasions did you identify? Seven. And did you also count the number of cuts to his left hand? Yes, I did. How many did you identify? Three cuts, one of which on the fourth finger had both an A and B portion. And that's that ring finger, right? Correct. Now, doctor, you said that uh, Mr. Simpson told you he got these injuries in Chicago. Is that correct? No, that's incorrect. That he cut it on glass? That's correct. Doctor, I want you to assume that there's been testimony received in this case that blood that was genetically tested and found to match Mr. Simpson's was found in the foyer and driveway areas of Mr. Simpson's home on Rockingham. Rephrase the question. That there has been testimony received that um, tests have been performed on what appear to be blood samples from the foyer and driveway area of Mr. Simpson's Rockingham estate, that in the opinion of expert witnesses, that uh, the genetic characteristics of those drops are uh, identical to the characteristics of Mr. Simpson, and therefore they form the opinion rephrase, rephrase that rephrase. the experts have formed an opinion that the blood is consistent genetically with Mr. Simpson's. Okay? Okay. You have that understanding? That's the hypothetical? <clears throat> That's part of it. Okay. And further, that Mr. Simpson left Los Angeles to go to Chicago sometime after 11 o'clock in the evening of June 12th and did not return to Los Angeles until sometime after officers from the Los Angeles Police Department observed such blood in the foyer and driveway area of Mr. Simpson's estate and had it collected for purposes of the subsequent testing that uh, I've asked you to assume was done and opinions formed as a result. And that also testimony has been received from Mr. Kalin, Cato Kalin, that he had observed this before Mr. Simpson returned from Chicago to his Rockingham estate. Do you have all of that assumption? Overruled. Do you have all of those assumptions in mind? Can you repeat just the last one with Cato Kalin? That Mr. Kalin had observed this blood in this area of the estate before Mr. Simpson returned from Chicago. Do you have okay. all that assumption? Yes, I do. Doctor, in your opinion, would the kind of cuts that you observed in Mr. Simpson's hand, left hand, be the kind of cuts that can leave blood drops? Yes, they can. And in fact, is the hand one of the most vascular that is full of little blood vessels areas of the human body? Face, head, fingers, absolutely. And doctor, assuming that Mr. Simpson, by saying that he injured his hand by breaking glass, was referring to an injury in Chicago on June 13th, do you have any information on how such blood, if it is in fact Mr. Simpson's, could have been left on the Rockingham foyer and driveway on June 12th? My own. 
What's the fact? What's the nature of that objection? Speculation. Sustained. Doctor, is your findings with respect to those cuts such that those cuts could be the source for blood droppings left by Mr. Simpson in his foyer and driveway on June 12, 1994, before he left for Chicago? Objection, Your Honor. There's so many facts. It is so speculative as to the size of the drop, the amount of the drop. Sustained. Foundation. <coughs> Doctor, how much blood, if you have an opinion, would you expect such uh, cuts in this highly vascular area of the hand to produce? Objection, compound. Oral. Oral. When you slash a finger, basically what happens is you've got this outer layer, the epithelium, which is maybe a millimeter, which is, you know, somewhere between a, a 32nd and a 16th of an inch. There's no blood vessels there. Then you go to the tissue right underneath. And of course, in the fingers, you know, unlike the rest of our body, you don't have that much tissue between uh, the outside and the bone. So basically, the dermis is going to be compressed somewhat. But you've got different layers. You've got the superficial uh, layer of the dermis where there's going to be smaller vessels, although they're anastomosing. And you've got the deeper vessels. And occasionally, even you have connections between the artery system and the venous system, because that's why the hands, when you're very cold, uh, can get cold, because the body says, I don't want to lose any heat through evaporation, and you'll shunt blood. So you can occasionally cut a vein that even bleeds a little bit like an artery, was what I was trying to say. So it's totally dependent on the depth of the cuts, and it's sometimes a haphazard sort of thing. You know, the veins wind through. I think it's quite variable, but certainly cuts of this nature could bleed significantly. Again, in my personal experience working emergency rooms, I never see people cut themselves and then just let it bleed. You know, I'll see somebody where they cut themselves and they come in with a uh, dish rag around their finger. Uh, but again, with cuts that don't appear absolutely dissimilar, you know, you can stain a dish cloth or something of that nature, absolutely. So I would say many drops. And in the healing process, is it accurate that there can be something called a temporary clot that initially takes place in an effort to stop the bleeding? Of course. You know, once you cut the veins or even if you happen upon an artery, the initial mechanism of clotting is that the platelets form a plug and that plug then gets aided uh, because the plug releases certain mediators and then the fibrin comes in which intercrosses and strengthens that plug. That is something that essentially happens relatively quickly. On the other hand, if it's on a joint or some other area, it may bleed longer with movement. And that was my next question, that you can have a temporary clot and then with movement of the hand, for example, such as Mr. Simpson's left hand, you can reopen what is that uh, cut with the temporary clot, correct? That is possible. And you can have a re-bleed, and then it'll temporarily clot again, and hopefully, at some point, the permanent mechanism of healing will have enough opportunity to take hold that you'll have no further bleeding. Is that correct? I think that's accurate. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Now, uh, Your Honor, I do have a video Now, Your Honor, I do have a video. I'd ask that this be marked. I think we're at 520? 521. 521. It's entitled uh, Playboy Entertainment Group, Inc., OJ Quad Split Tape 1. And I have cued it, uh, hopefully, to the area where I wish to start the tape. And I'll ask Mr. Perillo if you could, please. All right, and this is for the purpose of showing... The, for the doctor, doctor, yes. I'd ask, doctor, if you'll please watch this, and as an offer of proof, doctor, I want you to assume this is Mr. Simpson engaging in activities that are being filmed for the purposes of a exercise video, that the filming is taking place uh, around the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th of May 1994, sometime a little over two and a half weeks, three weeks by the time we get to your examination of June 15th, but a little over two and a half weeks before the date of the murders, June 12, 1994. 
So these are going to be repeated segments. That is, they reshot it uh, multiple times. There will be a timer on it. I'll ask you to just follow as the videotape is played. All right, and Mr. Carlo, have you tested the audio level on this? No, Your Honor, I have not. I'll start with that. that. Sounds hot to me. Proceed. And Your Honor, when it's first shown, if we could get the stop it one second. That it had a time of. 15, 17, I believe it's 01. All right, thank you. Proceed. We call easy pin. Uh, no, 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 all right, what we're going to start with is what we call easy impact. It's athletic, it's physical, and there's no dancing. What we've done is we've taken a lot of moves that you would use if you were competing in a sport and incorporated them in a cardiovascular workout for you ex-jocks, uh, weekend athletes, and some of you couch potatoes out there. I know you guys can handle it. And here to help us with it is one of the best motivators I know, personal trainer Richard Walsh. Thanks, OJ. All you guys have to do is be consistent with your workout, and you're going to lose fat. It's that simple. We're also going to increase your energy, strengthen our joints, improve the shape of the muscles, get a nice flexibility going for us. We're going to do it all in 25 minutes, three days a week. Okay, now this isn't a conventional aerobics uh, workout. It's something that anybody should be able to That's do. Right. If there's any part of this that you can't do, just don't do it. And sometimes there's some alternate things you can do that'll help you out. But we'll show you as we go along. Right. Why don't we get started, Dan? All set? Right. All right. Let's get going. All right, let's get going with just a real little bit of a warm up here just to elevate heart rate. Get a little blood in those muscles and get loose. How you feeling? Not bad, not bad. You know, when I first started playing ball, we didn't do much of loosening up. That's right. Yeah. Now we've spent about 20 minutes before workout getting loose. Oh, boy, this feels good to stretch it up and pull her down. Good, let's open up. We're just going to touch on some calves here. When we do this, keep the legs straight, but the knees soft. How the shoulders today, OJ? Oh, right. Let's try it. Huh? All right. Oh, this, this is, is a just, tight area, is it? Yeah. This is just to kind of get that blood, blood flowing, right? That's it. Better take them both right here. You know what we do? When we come up, let's pull them and pinch them down and back just a little bit. All right. Ready to sit on down? Let's go. Easy. Easy. Gotta get used to this. All right. Get a good knee bend, you guys. How about a reach? How does this help your golf game? This is great for my lower back, I can tell you that. Let's do it again then. Ready, here we go. Nice and simple. The whole thing about playing golf is getting a turn. That's it. Got to turn that waist up. Let's take the arm over the head. I mean, I can get down in the 70s just by doing that, yeah. as you tell me. OK, my favorite. A little ice skating movement right here. At least it kind of looks like an ice skating yeah, movement. Yeah, not quite. Now, <laughs> ready to rip an arm with it? Let's go. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting closer to that ice skate. Yeah. See, the more muscles we get involved, we get that heart really pumping. What do you say we take a step together? Oh, yeah, we're getting there now. Yeah. Stay down nice and low, you guys. Ah, let both arms stretch out. Here we go. Now I got the air tight. That's it. <laughs> That's uh -huh. it. Speaking of backs, OJ, let's take a step out and get the back. Here we go. Round, and we'll press it. Oh, man. Now, if you haven't worked out in weeks or years, you should be able to do this. Yep, exactly right. Careful on that lower back. Let's go one more time like this. Now, we'll hold it right here. We're just going to take one shoulder up in the air like this. Keep a lot of weight forward. Just let the spine lengthen out. Let's bring it back center. We're just going to open up inner thigh. You don't have to be real low here. Oh, well, really open that up. I would have a problem with because of my knees. Yeah. But Go ahead and turn the other way. I do feel the good stretch inside there. Yep. Good. Let's bring it back center, and then we'll go to the other leg here. So open up the inner thigh. Keep a lot of weight forward. Again, you don't have to be low. All right. Let's bring this up. We're going to do a little calf stretch. When you do a calf stretch, make sure this knee stays right over the ankle. should feel a great stretch right through here. Something you always want to do before you get started exercise. Let's make a change. We'll go down to the OJ stance. <laughs> In my old track days here. That's it. We're going to try to drop this hip a little bit, open up this hip flexor right here. 
going to need the floor. Okay, now this is something that I would have a little trouble doing because of my bad knee. Now, does this work for this? That works for go good. Back and go the opposite just way. Just lengthening that hamstring right through there. And all we can do is stand right here, and that's just fine. Let's go to push-up position. Okay, ready? Let's go. Here, whole idea behind doing a few push-ups in the warm-up, just put a little weight on the upper body. Don't have to be real low. Just keep the abdominals tight, the rear tight. <laughs> Should I tell them? Yeah. You guys have a few push-ups ahead of you, so get ready for these. <laughs> 